Good day, listeners, and welcome to Beyond the Checkbox, where you learn how to integrate more mental wellness into your organization, learning through frontline leaders. Today, one of those leaders that we're bringing on the show is Craig Dowden. Craig is a PhD. He's an author. He's a renowned speaker. He talks about positive psychology. He also talks about empathy and how we can use empathy in our leadership teams, in our teams, in our organizations to take our organization to the next level, but also thrive through very difficult circumstances. A lot of companies, a lot of leaders have been in crisis in the last two years. Craig has a methodology. He has a sense of how to help leaders and help teams through that. I'm very excited for the conversation today. I hope you are too. Thank you so much for joining us today on Beyond the Checkbox. I'm your host, Ryan Todd. So how has the how has the quarantine been for are you still in lockdown relative lockdown where you are relative lockdown although they are easing the restrictions so which is nice and people are looking forward to that so i think you know what's been challenging for people is starting off the year almost like a groundhog day so in the different with my client conversations or the ceo mastermind forums that i facilitate that's been challenging because it's almost okay If you were to say in 2021 that in 2022 vaccines in place, right, booster shots, where do you think we would be? I think the challenging part has been we've faced uh, a lockdown and and restricted measures. And so that's been that's been challenging because people are are looking forward to uh, turning the corner. Is it it ever going to turn the corner? Like, what's your take on this in the workplace? I happen to think things are permanently etched and changed. We are in this like workplace 3.0 thing right now. Um, And I bet you could inform a lot of your opinions based on this CEO mastermind, uh, these sessions that you do where you bring all these CEOs together and just have like, you know, really high level discussions about important things that are moving businesses. What are you hearing from the street right now in terms of where the workplace is going? Yeah, I I think you're absolutely right. I think this has, the global pandemic has shifted things uh, forever. It's tough to put it back into the box, if you will. And I think what's been really interesting is that the momentum around this was building for quite some time. The importance of leadership, the importance of a strong organizational culture, creating a, a strong emotional connection with our colleagues in the work that we do. And then when the pandemic hit, it was almost the ultimate pause button. And people have talked about the great resignation, even the great reset. To me, it's like the ultimate pause button whereby people step back. And when that day-to-day churn wasn't happening, they were asking questions like, so why am I here? What is all of this for? How do I want my life to move forward? And also I think COVID shone a light on, well, the way that we expected the world to be may not be that way. (laughs) And so now with all of that backdrop, it caused a lot of internal reflection. So I think leaders are figuring this out in varying degrees. And I think what's interesting and through my discussions, both within the mastermind forums, as well as my public webinars, where I have lots of great best-selling authors and international CEOs, they're saying, so, you know, where, how do we need to be in this space? And for people who haven't thought about that, for organizations and leaders, this is their first trip down that lane. It can be challenging. How are leaders responding? Like you, you, uh, you meet a ton of CEOs through your web and through your executive coaching. Are 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 executives up for the challenge? Uh, and how are you seeing things fall apart or, or come together? Like in, in medicine, we always talk about like families when they go through a crisis, like I, I still do a little bit of ICU work where, you know, we're, we're counseling a family after they've either lost or see another family member go through some illness. And we find two patterns. One, it brings the family together. The other pattern is it rips the family apart. 
And I can't tell you what can lead to those things, but what are you seeing? Because I imagine there's similar patterns with CEOs and executives when there's a crisis. Is it bringing people together? Is it ripping people apart? How are you seeing this develop? It's a beautiful parallel. And in fact, in a lot of the leadership development work that I do and webinars and workshops that I run, I will cite evidence from medicine and talk about how it parallels with leadership. Uh, so exactly what you just laid out, Ryan, is, is what we're seeing happening in practice. In some cases, it is building, it's bringing the organization together, people together in a way that they never envisioned. And there's been an openness, a vulnerability from CEOs, leaders, senior executives, employees, just sharing, hey, I don't know what's going on. I know there's a lot of challenges. Here's where I am. Where are you? And let's figure it out together. And then to your point, when it really starts to implode or there are a lot of challenges, it's almost ignoring reality, pretending like it's not happening, or trying to desperately get back to the way things were, or not having honest conversations about, well, I'm struggling, or this is hard for me, or what do you need from me right now? And so I think what it's done is put a preeminent focus on the humanity of the work that we do and the humanity of the relationships that we have. And then the extent to which organizations and its leaders adapt to that and start to really pay attention to those crucial variables that can lead to one road or the other. That's, I mean, the, the, the really wild thing there is that, of course, the humanity matters. And you still hear from a lot of business leaders behind closed doors often uh, that those metrics are soft. Or we, you know, we need to continue to make demands as a business and we need to push things forward or we need to get back to the way it was. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thing that like there, there's there's some organizations that just will not adapt. And I wonder what the consequences are, if any. Like, do you think there are very real consequences or are they, as some people would say, soft consequences? Well, I, I love uh, where you're going with this because, I mean, there's so much evidence that's out there. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to pursue my PhD. I, I'm a big, passionate fan and advocate for evidence-based practice from a leadership standpoint, from an organizational standpoint, from a personal standpoint in terms of the decisions that I make. And there's so much research that shows us that positive organizations, when employees are engaged, when they feel cared for, when they feel supported, it's not just a soft measure in terms of, hey, I feel happier. They're more productive. They're more innovative. They actually return higher bottom line, results for the bottom line. So that's absolutely extraordinary. And then if you look at the movement in terms of, to your point, that resistance, I think it's really interesting because one of the key factors that are going to really differentiate us and Pre-pandemic, you heard a lot about agility and adaptability. We'll look at some of the most powerful books that are entering into the mainstream right now. Adam Grant out of Wharton, his latest called Think Again, bestseller, Think Again. It's all around, all around how we rethink our assumptions. Ed Hess out of Darden wrote a fantastic book called Humility is the New Smart. So what's going to be required moving ahead is for us to be comfortable continually testing our assumptions and then bringing forward mental models that work and discarding those that don't fit the circumstance. Yeah, and you could see already some leaders where they're maybe, uh, maybe they'd get weeded out through. I love that humility is the new smart, um, admitting where your weaknesses are and where you're kind of dark. Uh, you know, black boxes of knowledge or expertise are. That was not a thing. I don't think you've seen an evolution in in leadership culture. Uh, am I am I bang on there? Am I right in saying that that was not a thing twenty years ago? In fact, it was about power and strength and knowledge and decisiveness. For sure, and uh, and your I love the book title. Humility is the new smart, and and then another uh, expression that Ed had in the book is the old smart is the new stupid. <laughs> And as an author, that's, that's genius. I wish I had put that in. Uh, and, and it just exemplifies the time that we're in. And I think you are right on about it in terms of, well, what happened? What's happened over the last couple of decades with social media and information democratization? 
So now there's just so much. So before knowledge was power, information is power. And so now there's so much information out there. The challenge is actually sifting through it all and sense making of the information that's available. And once again, I think there are leaders who, and going to the great resignation, some who are really stuck into, well, I need to see my team members in the office behind their desk in order to feel like they are productive. And that is, and what is that based on, even though their productivity can be higher and even though their engagement can be higher. And I think the, the real challenge facing leaders is going to be, okay, so if that's the case, like what's the rationale behind this? What's your, what are the assumptions that you have? What data do you possess in that way? So I do think that the notion of humility, the notion of vulnerability within leadership has certainly gathered steam. And I think the world's changing too fast for people to be on top of everything. You just can't. You never could. Now, <laughs> there's just no way to say that, that, that you know everything. Are you, are you teaching that in some of your coaching? Are you encouraging that, the vulnerability, authenticity? And then, you know, on the flip side, how do you balance that with some of the more traditional notions of leadership? which are you need to have an answer sometimes. Most of the time you need to lead a board. You need to be a decision maker. You know, how, do you, how are you balancing those two things when you are coaching CEOs and executives on that authentic uh, and vulnerable and uh, leading with some humility? Uh, well, I think several things. Number one, we can be afraid that when we are vulnerable that we're gonna lose the respect and the confidence of the people in our organizations. And what's really powerful is, and I share this with my uh, coaching clients as well, is that the evidence suggests that rather than respect and confidence go down, it actually goes up because people see you as human. And one of the key ways to disengage people is to feel like you're disconnected from reality. And I think the other piece is, is that, well, now what we want to do is start to think about, okay, so what am I going to say that I'm unclear about? And how do I share that vulnerability? And in the coaching work that I do, when leaders take that leap of faith, when they lead with courage, in every single circumstance, they'll come back and say, wow, like when I came into that meeting and I said, I'm not sure where we're going here. Here's my initial thoughts. And these are the things we're considering as we move down the path. The amount of positive feedback that they get, people thanking them for that transparency and for showing that level of honesty and, and humility and vulnerability is they've never experienced it before. So it increases their confidence in terms of continuing to open up their own to give some insight into terms of what they're going through. And I think I had Francesca Gino on from Harvard Business School. She's one of the thinkers 50, one of the amazing top 40 under 40 business professors, like just absolutely an extraordinary talent. And she was talking about, which I think made an amazing point, is that it's critical not to let people think that you're dumping your concerns on them so they're responsible for it. So acknowledging where we are and saying, hey, this is challenging versus, hey, Ryan, I don't know what to do when you fix it for me. It's subtle yet very, very powerful. And here's the other piece in terms of linking it to the confidence of decision making, which I'm really glad you brought up because I will quote Adam Grant again. I'll paraphrase because this is something I speak with my clients a lot about. And he says, I speak with the conviction as if I'm right and I listen with the conviction as if I'm wrong. And I think a lot of times we <laughs> we're really good at the first part, and then we struggle with the second part. And so I can show up and say, hey, this is where I think we're going. So I can still make decisions. And at the same time say, and a lot of my clients have done this, based on the data that becomes available, we may shift and here's how we're gonna make those changes. Well, now what that does is reduce ambiguity which now is a stress provoker for the vast majority of people. Do you find that there's just more discussion around this? Like in your, in your experience around coaching, which has been, how many years have you been in the, in like, let's say the business for how many years have you been executive coaching for? 
be a uh, it's a great question probably 20 years now that i've been uh, doing this for sure so so you've seen you've seen evolutions and revolutions and you know you've written books and you, you you've spoken to enormous audiences about this is the activity around this picking up because of all the change first of all is the activity picking up like do you, is there more discussion on leadership uh i have some some comments on that but first of all do you believe that to be the case that we're having more discussions on leadership for sure. And I think we're having, and I'll admit my own bias uh, as a positive psychologist, someone who's really keen in, in that space, I feel like we are having richer discussions around leadership. So even though the research has been out there for years, decades even, now we're talking more frequently about the importance of self-awareness, the importance of creating a respectful workplace, Leading with humility, the power of humility, leading with empathy. And so now those conversations that seem were less, so to your point, they weren't seen to be appropriate within the halls of leadership where it's just me and follow me and, you know, and I'm just going to blast through things and I don't have any weakness. That has shifted for sure. And I think for some leaders, it's been welcome in terms of we're finally getting there and this is absolutely fantastic. And for others, they've recognized, boy, if I don't start to reflect on this, I'm gonna be in trouble. And then there's another category, which is, I really don't like where we are and I wish we could get back to the good old days. Why do you think that is? Like I've, uh, I remember in my residency, I heard a physician uh, come onto the unit once with the residents kind of in tow. So the traditional, uh, like I, I really, I like to pay attention to like how people walk and interact in physical space and going through the medical system. It's, it's a really interesting case study. There was a physician and this happens on like medical teaching units and kind of where the hierarchy is more strong, but you typically see the staff physician walk ahead and then senior resident, mid-level junior, medical student like that is and then they we walk like ducks kind of in a row behind each other uh, but you can actually see the stratification right in front of you and i remember one physician saying when we used to walk on the unit we were gods <laughs> and it was so striking uh because he was obviously he in this case was talking about the good old days and uh, there was some pining for the good old days um, and there's a lot of reasons why in medicine that's changed. Why do you think there's a, been a shift in the conversation and increase in the frequency and intensity of that conversation in the workplace? What do you make of that? Well, and, uh, again, I just love personally, I love the parallels between medicine and leadership and, and organizational life because the whole notion of psychological safety comes up, right? In terms of, okay, so how are we innovating within our companies and how are we reporting up when we encounter challenges, when things are off schedule? And if you don't do that, well, guess what's gonna happen? You can make an error, not just an error, a catastrophic error in terms of the, the life of your organization. And so I think now what's happening is, is that people are recognizing, well, there are profound costs to that. And going back to, and I, and I love the point, you know, we were gods when we walked the floor. Well, as human beings, our egos can certainly get inflated very, very quickly. And we can enjoy that feeling of superiority. And here's the other piece that comes out through the research as well. Empathy is hard work. Like it's, it mm. takes energy, it takes focus, it takes attention for me to want to pay attention to you and, and ask great questions like you're doing to me, right? And go back and forth and have a conversation and truly be curious about someone else's experiences or perspective or what's important to them. And so there's that confluence of variables can make it easy to say, you know what, it's just simpler when people listen to me and do exactly what I say. And it's just simpler for me in terms of an energy and time perspective, if I don't have to bother myself with all of those things. The unfortunate part is, well, now it's a very insular reality and the quality of decisions and the engagement of the people around you are necessarily limited. Do you think leadership then is harder than it used to be? Yes. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, if 
you know, we step back and think about, so what has happened in the world over the last couple of years? Well, COVID, so a global pandemic, how do you lead through that? I don't know. You know, what's the guidebook? So before you could go to different case studies, be it a business school, right? Go to MBAs, you could purchase them or, or, or engage in an executive education and talk about different challenges that organizations face. And now within that, there's focus on the ESG, right? Environmental, social responsibility, governance. So that's becoming front and center. CEOs, leaders are being asked for their perspective on a variety of different issues, right? And so a lot of different things that they're commenting on and expected to comment on, which never before entered into the conversation. They were there to run a business. And that was the extent of their, and it's still a big responsibility. So I would say the complexities involved in leadership today, it's never been a more complex time to be a leader and also never a more rewarding time to be a leader when you can rally people together, energize people around well, a common objective, a common purpose. So it's worth it is what you're saying. It's worth it. The, the struggle is real and it's worth it. Absolutely. Well, and I think this is what's, and this is where, and, and, uh, and Marshall Goldsmith, another great book title, right? What got you here won't, won't get you there. And a lot of leaders, and you see this so much in the research in so many different ways, founders of companies or CEOs of companies, they fail to adapt as they move up the, the, the rungs, move up the ladder, right? And so what we need to do now, the, the, the real heart of leadership, the heart and soul of leadership is about bringing out the best in ourselves so we can bring out the best in others. And so the more self-aware we are, well, then we know we have great insight into the strengths, like where do I add most value, as well as the gaps, like where do I need support? And then with that knowledge, now I can get out there and say, so how do I do that? I'm in this privileged position to support the people in my team, within my organization, to be at their best. So this is not about me. It's about everybody else around me. So that kind of flip, when you flip that script, and it's amazing for executives that I work with, they'll say, well, as you move up in an organization, it can be more nebulous in terms of, well, what's those metrics, as you talked about the soft side, yet when you tap into that and really engage with people, the best thing that a leader can do is get out of the way and let other people do great work. That has to be a challenge for leaders. And I know it is a challenge for me um, and my some of my teams because there's things that I assume that I can do better. Right. And, I, you know, as a narcissist, I, I think there's a lot of those things. And then I have to it's really hard for me to just let people make mistakes, but, it, but that's how I learned. So I, it's so easy to lose that perspective. I want to take this back to medicine again, because there's so many parallels and obviously that's, that's so much of my lens. When you become a staff doctor, you, you very quickly forget the struggle that it took to get into medical school, to get a residency position, to pass your Royal college exam. And I see that, Time and time again, especially in the surgical field, where uh, the staff surgeons, you know, like the, the the surgical residents, they work hard. But the common narrative you hear all the time is that they do not work as hard as I used to work, and they they just forget that they're those residents are working incredibly hard, and um, it's amazing how quickly we forget that you know when once you are able to climb to a position, what it was like to learn and get to that place. So to tie that back, like for me, it's really tough to sit with someone and let them make mistakes that are needed to be made in order for them to learn in the same way I did. So I imagine that's a struggle. I'm, I'm hoping it's more than just me who struggles with that is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, and what I, uh, and I love, I appreciate you self-identifying as a narcissist. Although I, what I would say is that all of us have ego, right? And then what's the limits of our ego? And you don't strike me as a narcissist, although I can't clinically, I'm not a psychologist. I just hide it well, Craig. I just hide it. 
you know, <laughs> the nature of our conversation. Putting that aside, what I think is really, you, you raise so many important points though, Ryan, is in terms of, well, when you look at organizations and as you rise, this is one of the reasons why the TV show Undercover Boss, right, was so powerful because then when you went undercover, wow, and so many CEOs would go, when I built this business, look at what, what has happened to it. Like, this wasn't my vision when I started out. And then on top, that's the anecdotal side, yet there's a lot of scientific research that shows that the further up in an organization you go, then it's harder, the more power we have, the less empathy we can exhibit. We're at risk for lowering our empathy. And that's not, you know, that's not something to be feared. That's something to be understood, accepted and say, okay, how do I buffer myself against that from, from losing that, that empathy and that connection? And Dacre Keltner out of Berkeley wrote a great book on the power paradox, which talks a lot about that research and, and what happens. And then going back to your point, because I think it is, it's really tough for us to acknowledge, hey, someone may be able to do this better than me. And if you hear the top performing CEOs and the top performing organizations, what do they say? And they can almost seem like unicorns. I surround myself with people that are way smarter than I am, right? Like that's my objective. I can't know everything. So my gift, my unique value to the organization or to my team is X. So I sit back and think strategically about where we're going. Because if I'm not contemplating those high level questions, who is? And I think what's in the coaching conversations I have with executives and teams that I work with to go around to that delegation question, I think what, and again, ex an exercise in humility is to go to people and say, okay, where do I add the most value in our team? Or is asked another way, where do I add unique value? Like if I were to leave tomorrow, what would be the most challenging thing to replace if I were no longer a part of this collective? And then a flip side question, which can be more uncomfortable, which is now where are areas that I get involved where you could really do without me? I'm actually, you know, my, my value add, I'm not adding extra to the equation and I may even be diminishing it. And by asking those questions, it's really, now again, it requires humility and openness. It fosters a psychologically safe environment. Yet what's awesome is the more senior we get in an organization, well, then now it's how do I add unique value? That's what everyone, and talk about energizing. Well, it's all around, you look at the engagement research, right? We are most energized, most innovative, most productive when we're doing, we're more engaged in our natural talents, our strengths. And so when we can unlock the secrets of where do I add unique value or add the most value, boy, does that feel special because it's tapping into my talents and it's also contributing to people and an organization that I care about. So you're, you're coaching executives on how to find the areas that they're, they can add value, big value, unique value, focus on those, be okay and more comfortable with letting go of the areas, first identifying the areas that they're not adding value. Um, I, the, the striking thing you said to me was the the higher you get, the less empathy you have. And I want to dig into that a little bit because I imagine that makes it tough to uh, understand where your value is, understand the people around you, the higher you get, because you're losing that, you know, the spidey sense, those receptors are being dulled uh, the higher you get. It was so... First of all, I want, I want, tell me more about that. The higher you get in an organization, the less empathy you have. That sounds like a, that's an important thing to discover and, and dig into. So tell me more about that. Yeah, it's, it's a risk. And so that's important is that we're all at risk because the higher that you go, the more disconnected you are. So when you're on the front lines, you're talking to people using undercover boss is a great analogy, right? You know what's on the quote unquote shop floor, what's happening day to day. As you move up, now there are more spreadsheets, numbers and resources. And so now necessarily there are greater and greater sources of disconnect. And we can assume we're going to stay connected yet this is where we're at risk. And there's research that shows that when we're in positions of power, we tend to use more stereotypical algorithms, 
right? And we tend to use more objectification. And once again, that's something for us as we climb, again, is to be mindful of that. And how might I lose that empathy, especially if it's a strong suit? And that's at the crux of Dacre Keltner's book I mentioned earlier, The Power Paradox. What gets leaders sometimes into positions of authority is, is their empathy. And then when they get into the position of authority, they lose it. It's like, oh, gee, Craig used to be this way. Or remember, before Ryan was a leader, he was X. And now look at him all da da da. And now they're gunning for us to get out of the world or they don't want to support us. So I think what it is, is it's, and, and this is again, I'll admit my own bias in terms of the positive psychology side, is look at it as an immense opportunity. Hey, this is a real risk factor for me. So what are the things that I can introduce into my leadership practice on a continual basis to ensure that I continue to lead with empathy? That in, I maintain the strengths of my authenticity. And these things are really important uh, for, for leaders to do. When you said uh, there's a risk, like that, that is also very striking. And I, I think it's true. And I sometimes think about empathy as a, like a pool of energy or a bucket, you know, like there's only so much that you can empathize with and toward. And I imagine the higher you get, like, let's say you run a team of 10 people, you can be deeply ingrained in the, those 10 lives, right? And really care about everything. Then you run a team of 100 people, it becomes very difficult. When you run a team of 1,000 people, or you're a CEO of a 1,000-person company, of course you care. And it is impossible. We are only human to have that level of empathy for 1,000 people. So I can see how that power paradox works. And I could see how that that risk works. And I also see how people could perceive that, um, oh, Craig used to be this way. He used to be such a nice guy. Now he's, you know, he is what he is. He's cold. <laughs> he's calloused. Yeah. And I wonder if it's across a period of time too, because we have, like, we can refill that empathy bucket. Uh, but I've heard a lot of leaders over the course of COVID say that just the number of conversations we're having about things like mental health has been draining that. Um, the thing I have often talked about uh, when I'm, you know, chatting in webinars or, you know, doing seminars is that um, empathy can be a finite resource, uh, but we, we have the ability to recharge it. Like it is in, it is within our power. It is, it is, it can be a renewable resource. Um, it, it's not a zero to one thing. And we can also train ourselves uh, to, let's say, leak out that empathy in really effective ways. And I think that's what psychiatrists do really well. That's what a lot of training around psychiatry is, is how to create reasonable boundaries while caring for that individual who is in front of you. Um, and I, I don't know if leaders have great training in that because I think it's an effective skill. I wonder if you see that. It's a brilliant point. And I'm, I love that you said boundaries because I think, and you're absolutely right in terms, there is the risk of compassion fatigue because if all I do is feel for everybody, well, that's a tremendous uh, responsibility to take on. And now, and I love, and here's what's interesting. There are lots of different nuggets and through the conversations that I've had, I remember Doug Conant, former CEO of Campbell's Soup, right? He would say, I'm tough on standards and soft on people. So as another, so this is, you know, because sometimes we can look at it as neither or, right? Like that, oh, well, I can be empathetic or I can drive results. Um, and, and now what's really fascinating is, is that rather than see it as a dichotomous trade-off, it's that, so how do I leverage empathy as a leader to accomplish the things that are most important to everybody that's here. And so setting those boundaries is really critical. So an empathetic leader, if there are performance challenges, rather than say, oh, well, well I'm not going to engage and well, we're not going to have this uncomfortable conversation, it's going to be, hey, Ryan, I, I noticed some things are off in terms of the performance where we are. So what do you need from me right now? So what's happening in your world? Like what information do I need to know? What are the alternatives that we have available? And let's have an open conversation and a dialogue. 
And I think that's where it really unlocks. And once again, this is something whereby we're understanding someone else's reality and then also sharing our own because that's important. And that's an equal part of, to me, the empathy conversation, right? It builds a bridge for us to raise our level of understanding. And understanding doesn't necessarily mean agreement either, right? Which is really powerful. So now if we're in a collective, let's co-create a solution. And one piece of research, because as you know, I'm so passionate about the science around this, the management research group, uh, they do 360 feedbacks. And there was a study of over a half a million managers, executives, C-suite executives. And they have 22 competencies in their 360. Empathy was the third strongest predictor of executive excellence out of the 22. And I think that's awesome. And people, all, people always ask me, well, what were the top two? Number one is strategic thinking. And number two is communication. Now to me, you know, I think it's, uh, you can make a pretty compelling argument. Not only is empathy the third strongest predictor of executive excellence, how can you think strategically if you have no idea about the stakeholders that you serve? How do you communicate effectively if you have no interest, ability, or insight into the needs of your audience? So I think it's kind of like that holy trinity of executive excellence in terms of how empathy, not only as a standalone, impacts other critical competencies. And here's the last point, because I'm so I love this. Empathy was the strongest predictor of the 22 of ethical leadership. And now what's really powerful about that, you think about the context in which we're living right now, Ryan, and you see the preeminent focus on doing the right thing, leading with integrity. And what's powerful about that research, and I've had discussions with CEOs and senior leaders, it doesn't mean they're not making the tough choices. They're introducing or maximizing humanity into those choices. Even if it means that we're going to reduce staff in a particular area of our business or hey we need to pivot and figure out what we're going to do here and so now it informs a more ethical decision as opposed to prevents one i'm i'm really glad to hear you say this because i i have thought often that i am too sensitive at times as a leader, but that sensitivity is because of, I believe empathy. And I, if we're tracing this back to like what's going on in my brain, like I, I, I've tended to feel like I have more, uh, mirror neurons, like on average, let's say we have those mirror, like, let's say I have five, uh, and we put it on a bell curve. Uh, you know, the average would be four. Let's say I just tend to have a couple more where I feel things physically and emotionally more intensely uh, when something happens to somebody else. Okay, so that that has, for me, been a benefit for my practice of psychiatry because I can feel what somebody else is going through. They're suffering their pain. Um, and in, in the work that we're doing at adversity, I felt has been crucially important because I can sit down with someone and try and really get to the bottom of their pain and solve it through our software and our, our training and what we do through adversity. And when there's a conflict with an employee, I, you know, I felt that it's helped where it hasn't helped. And this is where I've, I've often felt like I wish I had less empathy and I'm not bragging about this because it's hard work and it, it, it is really draining to have that much, have more mirror neurons, I believe. Um, and there's some studies to back that up in medicine that the, the medical students, for example, who are more empathic when they enter medical school, uh, tend to get more burnt out throughout that process. So there is a downside to it. But I'm really uh, glad to hear that um, my kind of this nagging thought that I had that, you know, I could do with a little less empathy or I could do with a little uh, more uh, cold and callous uh, movement towards my interactions. I'm glad to hear that that is actually quite counterproductive in business. Uh, for sure. And I think, and, and you, and again, I'm really happy that you use the term boundaries because one of your earlier questions, when we were talking about vulnerability and talking about what Francesca Gino shared with me right around, well, 
you don't want to make that someone else is like just divesting of that and saying, well, now this is your problem to solve. And I think by being empathetic, we can be keenly interested in someone else's reality, someone's situation. And now just as their reality is there, well, if we are working together, if we're a team, well, my reality is equally as valid. So this is what I think is so, and this is where we can get off kilter, is that, well, the leader says, well, it's all me. So just do whatever I want, whenever I want, and that's it. So that's 100 zero. Or conversely with the employee, well, everything that I want, when I want it, and that's it, and it's 100 zero. If we're working together, both of our realities are essential. And now if we wanna continue working together, now it's incumbent on us to figure out, okay, what is a collective path forward? What are the things that we need to do? And then this is what makes it so powerful because to me, empathy is the door through which you enter mutual understanding. So now I have maximum insight into where you are. You have maximum insight into where I am. And now with that reality, and I think that's also crucial. Empathy to me is also about dealing with reality. You don't put reality aside. And you talk about how it informs your medical practice, right? So that gets into it. So we're talking about these are these can be hard things we're discussing. If we're talking about, well, hey, our revenues are down 50%. I can make a decision, a unilateral decision to just cut the division. Or I'm just gonna take out, or I can go and say to people, hey, this is here's where we are, and this is a really challenging time, and here's what. I'm, I'm being open and this is our financial situation. And so we can either, you know, if we continue down this path, it may lead to some really challenging decisions in a month or even less in terms of the headcount here. Or we have the opportunity for each of us to cut back to four days a week so that we all stay a part of this group and that we continue working together. These are empathetic conversations, right? These are building mutual understanding. And I think that's what's really I've had so many conversations, privileged conversations with executive CEOs that I work with, where they, as an example, the business could no longer support a division. And it was a division that led to where they were in the market. And they had to say goodbye. And then what they did, even though some wanted to just basically, this is just, you know, we're going to make the decision because this is going to be really rough and, and we don't want people to start sabotaging and it was, no, we're going to let people know this is coming. Like, here's the numbers. This is the financials. Here's where the market is. And then more importantly, how can we support you? What do you want to do? How do you want this to unfold? And did a couple of people leave? For sure. And that was fine. It was like, hey, great. And was there sabotage? Was there? No, not at all. And then the day of people work later, there were tears and other things because my humanity, you understood, you involved me in the decision that affected me in a profound way. That's not easy. That's, that's challenging work. Yet to me, it's a beautiful illustration of the power of empathy and empathetic leadership. Yeah, I really like that. And it's, uh, you could see the, 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 the diametrically opposing forces. And I think it comes down to that leader's insight and how that leader perceives their energy. Um, and where that energy, because that situation that you outlined sounds like the best business outcome. It also sounds like a ton of work, emotional, deep, connected, highly empathic work. Um, and you could see a situation where a leader says, I don't have time or energy for that. We have to cut bait and go ahead and move our organization forward. Um, and that would probably result in who knows some lawsuits and some, you know, some, you know, karmic fallout from the world and some glass door reviews that are terrible. Um, and yeah, that, that balance of the internal energy of that leader, I think is something that is, it is, uh, it's can be precarious. And I imagine that's what a lot of your work is. I'm guessing that's where a lot of your work goes into trying to help leaders balance that energy. Well, and it's bang on. And, and then, as you said, you know, okay, I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. Like, we just got to take action on this. And it's like, okay, fair enough. That's a fair position. And going back to think again, or humility is the new smart, and reflecting on it from an empathy standpoint. If you perceive 
what are the likely consequences of managing it that way? What are other ways that you could potentially manage this? And what are the potential benefits for that? And then this is where, and, and sometimes, and this is where going back to leadership, being the ultimate responsibility and also the ultimate reward, we can look to shortcut ourselves and other people and just go, you know what? Well, I just, you know, look at the division. We just need to, to cut and do it now. And that's because, well, it's easy. It's the easier thing to do. And then to your point, imagine what the implications are going to be. So in the example I just shared, like people would go all over the place and promote, even though they no longer had a job. So you've got to go to work for this company because they're just amazing. They even did A, B, C, and D. And then people say, wow, how can I be a part of that type yeah. of organization? So, and, and maybe are there circumstances where, yes, you have to, you know, within an hour, make an immediate decision. It's theoretically likely. Yes. Once again, is it more about making an easier choice, a, a, you know, a less uncomfortable choice for us? So just trying to suppress it and put it aside and just kind of power on and, and be more callous in our orientation or more calculated, like, you know, well, it's not mine. Look at this. And then if we step back and say, well, how are the people who are leaving as well as the people who are going to continue here? What's that going to be like for them? Totally different. And it's important to consider. And that's what's key. And to me, a huge part of my passion about leadership and coaching is, is that it's, it is amazing to me how often we do things for a particular reason. And then we're upset about the consequences that almost were guaranteed by the choices or actions we took. So in my coaching work, I say to people, whatever you choose, the worst possible outcome for us is to beat ourselves up or get mad with ourselves or others over things that that was a necessary consequence of what we chose to do. So then if we are doing it truly for reason X, that should be sufficient. And yeah, it can be challenging to reconcile. And then it's important to let that go and, and move on and continue to lead. And this is where being clear on our values is also so important, right? As a leader and as an organization. Craig, I, I first want to thank you for your expertise here, uh, but you've also shone a light on some very uh, new concepts, concepts that I think are changing the conversation. And what I, I experience it as a very congested conversation right now. YouTube, you can look up 20 thought leaders and they all have time and space. Um, and I think you bring a clarity to this space, which is why you have so much traction. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, appreciate you coming on the show to to share your thoughts with, you know, the leaders who chime into to our podcast. Tell us what you have going on right now. We want to hear about it. Uh, what's the COVID world like for you? Because you used to do a lot of public speaking. Uh, you're doing the CEO masterclass work right now. Um, what are you writing right now? Tell us about what's going on in your world. Well, thank you. No, this was, uh, and, and I love being a part of this conversation. And one of the things that really attracted me to to want to speak with you is around the values and what's important and, and the conversation that you want to initiate, because as you said, it's a congested space and it could be a loud uh, yelly space and people, you know, looking to, to get their position out there as opposed to let's discuss it and let's Let's talk to one another, which I'm a big fan and, and advocate for. So thank you for creating that and appreciate your question about what I'm up to. Yes, I'm now I've transitioned into the virtual space and do a lot of webinars, a lot of keynotes around topics that we talked about today, resilient leadership, how to build a peak performing culture and organization, psychological safety, the science and practice of positive leadership, humility, empathy, self-awareness. And I am really excited to be working on my next book, which is called A Time to Lead, Mastering Yourself So You Can Master Your World. And my first book, Do Good to Lead Well, which discussed the six pillars of positive leadership, the way I described it, it was almost like, this is how you lead others uh, and, and the key pieces that you want to think about. So there was a part of it around self-leadership and then a larger part of the Venn diagram was around leading others. And now this is almost like the complement to that, whereby the 
the bulk of what I talk about here is around self-leadership. So things that matter most to you as a leader. So mastering your mindset, mastering your emotions, mastering your resilience, your strengths, receiving feedback, having difficult conversations, and the last chapter, which is around mastering our authentic leadership, which in today's world is the thing that people are looking for. Who are you? What do you believe in? Where do you want us to go? And do you care that I'm here with you? So I'm really excited that'll be out in the, in the late summer. So uh, uh, can't wait to have that into the publisher. So I'm like, yay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I can't wait to read that. There's just, there's five or six topics there that are highly resonant with me and our team and everything that we're trying to do. So yeah, we're anticipating that. Um, so yeah, excited for that. And congratulations on all your work so far. And uh, of course, thank you for coming on to the show and sharing everything that you've studied and lived and breathed and coached on uh, in the last 20 years. We're, uh, we're, we're much better for it. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I, I learned a lot through the conversation and really enjoyed it. And, uh, and it's great for me as well. I think one piece for me is that the transferability of what we're talking about, right? I love that you're sharing uh, from your experiences in medicine and then sharing about the work that I do from a leadership organizational standpoint and talk about it from the context of our personal lives. What I think is so powerful, all the things we're discussing here impact us in every facet of our lives. And so to have those conversations and be aware of this and look at how we can learn and grow and support each other. I think that's awesome. Great. Thanks, Craig. We'll be in touch very soon. Thanks for taking your time today. Take care. Bye, everybody.